I don't even have to do a talk. <laughs> Everything she said in that song was exactly what I'm going to talk about. Let's give her another hand. Thank you, Chelsea. <laughs> Stand in the light and be seen as you are, because it takes courage, absolutely. To start out, I want to tell you that I had a little panic this morning. I started getting dressed, and I put on five or six pair of pants, and they all looked like this, all baggy, because I'd lost 20 pounds. <laughs> and I haven't had a chance to go shopping yet, so sorry about that, but that's the way, it's, that's the way it is. What you see is what you get. <clears throat> I'm going to, you know what our theme for the year for all the Centers for Spiritual Living is living out loud. And I found this poem by Hafiz, the uh, 13th century Persian poet. And it's perfect for this morning, perfect. I sometimes forget that I was created for joy. My mind is too busy. My heart is too heavy for me to remember that I've been called to dance the sacred dance of life. I was created to smile, to love, to be lifted up and to lift up others. O oh, sacred one, untangle my feet from all that ensnarrels it. Free my soul that we might dance and that our dancing might be contagious. Hafiz. Yeah, I love that. So it's perfect for living out loud. Last week, our coach, Dave Friedman, posted on his uh, blog that uh, he had, there was an 85-year-old woman that was uh, close to making her transition, and they, uh, she said, there are a few things that uh, I would do differently. If I had my life over, she said, I would start barefoot earlier in the spring and stay that way later in the fall. She said, I would eat more ice cream and less beans. <laughs> I would try to make more mistakes. I would love more dogs and I would keep later hours. I would perhaps have more actual troubles, but I had left less, fewer imaginary ones. I would try not to be perfect, and I would be more relaxed. So when I heard that and read that, <clears throat> excuse me, I remember that Irma Bombeck wrote something like that at, at the end of her life, and someone had asked her, she said, was there anything you do different, or were there any regrets? She thought about it, and she said, no. Then she thought about it again. And she has a list this long. <clears throat> so I'm just going to read you a few of hers. If I had my life to live over again, I would never have insisted that the car windows be rolled up on a summer's day just because my hair was coiffured and teased. <laughs> I would have invited friends over for dinner even though the sofa was, uh, sofa was uh, faded and the carpets were stained. I would have taken the time to listen to my grandfather as he rambled on about his youth. I would have burnt the pink candle, the one that was shaped in a rose before it melted in storage. I would have eaten less cottage cheese and much more ice cream. Yeah, there's an ice cream theme here, you know? They both said ice cream, so I've been eating more ice cream, so anyway. No. <laughs> when my child kissed me all over the face, I never would have said, later, honey, now go get washed up for dinner. And last but not least, there would have been more I love yous there would have been more I'm sorry. I would have been more, I would, there would be more listening. But mostly, given another shot at life, I would have seized every minute of it, looked at it, and really seen it. 
I would have tried it on, lived it, exhausted it, and never give that minute back until there was nothing left of it. What a way to live your life out loud, wouldn't you say? So what would be your list if you had to do it over again? But guess what? You don't have to do a do-over. You can do it now. You're still here. So make your list. Do those things that bring you joy and bring you happiness. Do the things that would make a difference in your life. We were created to live our life out loud. We were not created, believe it or not, to be stressed, live in chaos, or live with drama. We are here to shine our divine light. That's why we're here. Our friends, Roxanne and Ron, would you stand up for a minute? Roxanne and Ron, stand up. That's what they do. They live their life out loud. They live their life out loud. And as this lovely couple is moving to Colorado, they have been a part of our spiritual community. I don't remember how long, but years and years. I feel like I've always known you. And so we have an opportunity today. This is their last Sunday here, and then they're moving. So um, they have provided a light lunch for us after the service. So please come back and give your love and your farewells to Roxanne and Ron. Thank you. Thank you for being a part of us for so long. I will miss you. <laughs> and I know a lot of us will. I will miss you. So this brings us to April. The whole month of April's theme was the power of vulnerability. The power, which is kind of an oxymoron. But vulnerability is the key ingredient to our own personal transformation. It is also the building block for a thriving and a healthy community. These past several weeks, Reverend Alice has given us much food for thought on this particular subject. And in my opinion, Reverend Alice is the perfect example of the power of vulnerability. She is transparent. She is non-judgmental, and she is authentic. We are so very blessed that she made the choice to be our spiritual leader two years ago. We're so blessed. She talked about being vulnerable. That can be scary, but it was a path to healing. She also shared parts of her life and her journey with us last week and the week before. So I will continue doing that today as I share my spiritual and my life's path with you. Today's topic, vulnerability, seeing, and I see you, and being seen, and you see me. I think we should say our affirmation together again. So repeat after me. I allow myself to see and be seen. I allow myself to see and be seen. Wikipedia says that vulnerability refers to the quality or state of being exposed to the possibility of being harmed or attacked, either physically or emotionally. It's a window of vulnerability is a time frame with which the defensive measure measures are diminished, compromised, or lacking. But it also says that it can provide a sense of belonging and is essential. It's essential to the human experience. If you become aware of your bar barriers that you need to overcome, you can take steps to overcome them and then you will enjoy a better connection with yourself and others. Isn't that our goal here on this planet at this time? To love, 
and to be loved? To see and to be seen? To be transparent and authentic so that we can connect heart to heart and soul to soul. Brene Brown says that vulnerability is not a weakness. Yay, I like that. Yay. It is our most accurate measure of courage. I totally agree with that. It takes a huge amount of courage and faith to let our protective walls come down and to open ourselves to healing, to love, and connection. Brene Brown says in her book, The Gifts of Imperfection, I quote, <clears throat> we cultivate love when we allow our most vulnerable and powerful, powerful selves to be deeply seen and to be deeply known, and when we honor the spiritual connection that grows out from that offering with trust, respect, kindness, and affection. My two of my most powerful mentors and teachers were Dr. Heather Clark and Dr. Tom Costa from the Palm Desert Church. I took a class from him, and, and Dr. Heather was my um, teacher all through the years and my ministerial teacher. They both told me a long time ago that to be a good minister, you must be transparent. You must be seen so that you can see others and make that connection. I've been a minister now for almost 20 years. In July, it'll be 20 years. And that has worked for me. That's worked for me. I know some of you have been with me these past 20 years. Dina, Elaine, Barbara, and Ken. I know there's a lot of you have been with me all those years. So what I'll be saying in the next little bit here, I've said before, and you, but I don't think you remember what I said 20 years ago. <laughs> if you did, then hey, good for you. <laughs> I know there's only one mine. <clears throat> so I took a deep breath. I gathered my courage. Let me say I apologize to my mom already because she hates it when I do this. Uh, I saw the title, Seeing and Be Seen. Reverend Alice was so right on when she said being vulnerable is the path to healing. That's been my experience. So the first 18 years of my life, mom, <clears throat> was textbook perfect. I had the perfect childhood. Two parents that just loved me unconditionally a brother who is here today who loved me also, but he liked to tease me, as <laughs> brothers do. I attended the uh, Unity Church all my life in Pasadena and all those years, so I had a great spiritual foundation for my life's journey. Thank God I had that core. I got married at 18. I had two beautiful daughters, Julie and Carrie. Life was good until it wasn't. And you know, what happens? You know, who knows? Nine years later, I got divorced and then moved to Northern California. <clears throat> the next 10 years was a real ro roller co coaster uh, ride for me. It was lots and lots of ups and downs. I did it all. I tried it all. I lived it all, and I lived my life way out loud. <laughs> too much, might say, too much. <laughs> Janet Mock wrote the book called Redefine Realness, My Path to Womanhood, Identity, Love, and so much more. And she said this, I believe that telling our stories first to ourselves, which is painful, and then to one another, which we have done, and then to the world is a revolutionary act. 
So I'm holding on to that right now. I needed to read it again to move forward. Being transparent is scary, and it brings up feelings of, of fear and, um, yeah, weird feelings of maybe not being enough or being rejected. But I remember also it is the path to deep healing. <clears throat> Between the years of 1975 and 1985, for if you're counting, that's 10 years, about 10 years there, I used and abused alcohol and cocaine. I used it to numb my feelings. I was a victim of rape, which, me, which resulted in a pregnancy, which resulted in an abortion. I was held by gunpoint for 12 hours in my own home by an ex-boyfriend. Thankfully, my girls were visiting my parents at the time, so they weren't home. My boyfriend was a Vietnam vet, and he was the sole survivor of an attack on his ground unit. He struggled with survivor's guilt, and sometimes it just made him snap. It just, he just snapped. So after 12 hours of being held by gunpoint, he put the gun down and walked out the door, and I was free. But it was very frightening, and it took me a long time to heal that fear. During those 10 years, I was stalked by a person for about four or five months, and then he, he left. And I found out later from the police that came to my door that he had murdered a 15-year-old girl. Um, and it took me a long time to get over that because I knew that I had been in his scopes for the next victim. <clears throat> During that time, I was physically and mentally abused. Marianne Williamson says that we let our light shine. We unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence actually liberates others. That's why I say this. When I'd said it 20 years ago, I had clients come to me that knew that they would not be judged by me because I'd already done it all. How could I? How could I? I was transparent. So I believe that only good can come and only healing can come from the experience that I have had. I thank God and I thank the science of mind philosophy for the two spiritual tools that I learned going to classes and going to retreats and all those things. I learned, I was given the spiritual tools to heal all these things that happened and it brought it all to light. So needless to say, there were issues to be healed between my daughters and I because of the past drama and the past uh, chaos that they were with me in hell with at that, on those times. So years ago, some of you ladies remember, we had a retreat called the Wise Woman Weekend. And it was so much fun. We would go to Desert Hot Springs, and we went to a beautiful hotel, and we'd do drumming, and we had great food, and we'd sit in the hot, hot tubs, hot springs, and we had uh, workshops. It was a wonderful, wonderful Wise Women weekend. Well, I invited my daughter to go with me this one weekend, and this one session was where you could write a letter to the person that you had feelings of feelings about that you needed to get out, had issues with. You had feelings of separation or hurt. You could write a letter. Well, my daughter wrote a letter. My daughter, Julie, she wrote a letter. And so she read me the letter, and Dr. Heather was sitting here, and Dr. Jake Claypool, who were both of my teachers for his ministerial training, he was sitting next to Julie, and Heather was talk sitting next to me, Dr. Heather, as Julie read. 
She poured out her feelings of fear, rejection, not feeling safe at all when she was growing up. And I listened, and I cried, and I opened myself up to her pain. I really heard her this time, and she forgave me for those many mistakes and those poor choices that I made over those years, and a healing occurred. My other daughter, Carrie, she always forgave me. <laughs> she's, yes, I know she's watching right now. <clears throat> Hi, Carrie. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I have the two of the most wonderful daughters there. We have wonderful relationships now, so it's it really a deep healing happened. But it took me several more years working on myself to put behind me the guilt and the shame. I'm sure you've all heard the expression, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> have you heard it before? Yeah, well, it's in the Bible. Matthew chapter 16, verse 23. And it's interpreted to say that Jesus was telling Peter that his thinking was wrong. So get behind me, Satan. How perfect is that? How perfect. Knowing that our thoughts are things and that our thoughts create our experience and that we have the choice to change our thinking and change our life. Thank God we have that choice. Being vulnerable and transparent, we are given the opportunity to bring our past mistakes and our issues up to the light of truth where a healing can occur. We must listen. We must open our hearts and open our minds. And we first must forgive ourselves and then we can forgive others. In 1986, I moved back to San Clemente and I found this spiritual center in 1989. I started taking classes soon after and I've never stopped. Until 1999, Dr. Jackie was our spiritual leader and she told me back then, I think you'd make a good minister. And I laughed so hard, I fell on. I just said, are you kidding? Me, with my colorful past? No way, there's no way I can do that. Then Dr. Heather came in 1999, and she convinced me to continue classes and become a minister. Thank you, Dr. Heather, thank you. So I did two things at that time. I became a minister in 2003, and I learned to ride a motorcycle. <laughs> two fun things, kind of different, but not really, both scary, both being vulnerable. So I had turned 50 at the time, and I thought I've got to do something really different. Yeah, okay, be a minister and be a biker chick. Oh, <laughs> who would have thought? So I rode that, I bought a Sportster, and I rode that motorcycle for 12 years, and I loved it. I was living life out loud. I went to Sturgis and the, the Dakotas. I rode the mountains. I, I did it all. It was so much fun. I loved it, and I loved being Reverend Biker Chick. Loved that part. <laughs> So I know for a fact that sometimes it's easier for us and less painful for us to shut down and deny some circumstances or situations in our life. As most of you know, I have a beautiful 31-year, <clears throat> sorry, always chokes me, 31-year-old granddaughter who is a heroin and fentanyl addict and has been since she was 14. Over the past years, um, it would have been so much less painful for me had I just shut her off out of my life. Because I went through with her whole family, we went through the ups and the downs of addiction, and it hurts. In the Science of Mind textbook, Dr. Ernest Holmes says, pray until you get a demonstration 
a demonstration means an answer to your prayer. And in the Bible, it says, rejoice always and pray without ceasing. So that's what I do. I love her. I support her spiritually and emotionally. And I pray for her highest and best for her soul's journey. I can't do anything else but that. I have chosen to be vulnerable. We all have that choice. So remember, there is nothing we have done, said, or thought which rises up against us, which has power over us, or which limits us. There is no memory of fear. There is no condemnation for previous mistakes. We are divine spiritual beings living life out loud. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let us pray. So we join together once again in consciousness, really knowing that there's only one life and one mind. It is the AI, it is the absolute intelligence. It is the first cause to all of creation. It is joy, beauty, kindness, and compassion. And each one of us are a sacred activity of this energy and this presence. We are an excellent idea in the mind of God. We are perfectly imperfect. We are beloved and we are loved. We make mistakes and we are forgiven. We move forward and let our light shine. And we touch everyone's heart and soul. And we are blessed. So knowing that I speak the truth and the truth surely does set us free. Free to be that divine light, that joy and to live our life out loud. I give great thanks for this knowing, and I anchor this prayer in love as we say together, and so it is, amen.